Yeah, so um, um, also our next speaker um, might be well known to um, this audience. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Kathy Wu to our circus workshop on traffic and autonomy. Kathy received her PhD in EECS at UC Berkeley in 2018 and is now a professor at MIT for civil and environmental engineering. I would dare to say that she's one of the pioneers in using machine learning um, in traffic. And I just um, welcome you now, Kathy. The stage is yours. Um, and we are very curious of what you show because Alex yesterday already, Alex Bayen already showed um, a lot of your results um, um, from the last couple of years. So we are curious. Thank you very much. The stage is yours. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. It is so great to see so many uh, familiar faces. Um, I miss all of you. So I'm excited to be able to uh, share a bit of what I've been up to uh, recently. I'm, this talk was mostly focusing on one of our recent works. I'm happy to talk about others um, offline or, or anything. So uh, do get in touch if you're, um, if you're interested or in the neighborhood. Um, so today's talk, I'm going to focus a bit. I, I will, I will like probably like, you know, reiterate some of what has already been known and heard by this audience, but I'll focus this talk on one topic I've been very interested in recent years, uh, which is this idea of how, to what extent transfer learning can um, be effective in helping us with learning for mixed autonomy uh, traffic settings. So we definitely don't solve this question. It's a I think it's a really big and interesting question. I think this will also, it may also have implications for um, the field of reinforcement learning uh, as well. Okay, so what I'm gonna do in this talk is I'm gonna introduce a bit um, mixed autonomy traffic and I'm gonna put it into context of why we want to consider transfer learning in the first place. And then I'll spend most of the talk on uh, transfer learning for mixed autonomy traffic. And this is, mostly coming from a recent ITSC paper uh, called Reinforcement Learning for Mixed Autonomy Intersections. Okay, so um, this is really preaching to the choir. So I'm just gonna say, we're excited about self-driving cars and like its potential for safety and um, efficiency, uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction and access. Um, but uh, the answer is not like fully straightforward. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to what happens between now and when we have like full autonomy systems, and hence we study mixed autonomy systems. So um, energy is often like my go-to motivation for, for this and that how uh, wherever we are on transportation energy today, it's hugely uncertain where we may end up. I apologize to some of you who have seen, who saw Alex's talk yesterday. <laughs> um, uh, Anyway, so this mix, this huge range of projecting our energy consumption comes from uh, a lot of different factors. Uh, for instance, uh, there's just like a ton of different factors that can either increase our efficiency such as platooning or uh, decrease our efficiency uh, or rather increase our consumption of energy. For instance, uh, reducing the travel cost of, uh, reducing our travel costs and thus uh, more people um, induced, induced demand and more people wanting to uh, sit in cars. So weighted, different weighted likelihoods of these factors contribute to this huge range of uncertainty. And so, you know, um, in order to make more progress here, I argue that we have to understand the intermediate regime, which is mixed autonomy. So um, why is this mixed autonomy problem difficult is what I wanna talk about next. This is a very complex problem space. As many of you know, a lot of like, decades and decades of analysis have gone into this. So I cannot do this justice in one slide, but I'm going to try anyway. So I am going to try to distill this, the difficulty of mixed autonomy traffic into two axes. Uh, first of all, um, the very natural axis of the degree of autonomy. Here, I will think about this only as uh, the fraction of vehicles that are automated in the system. And then I'll talk about the second axis later. So on one end, we have um, no autonomy. Uh, we have some network with some vehicles and none of them are automated. Uh, and on the other end, we have vehicles that are fully automated, denoted by uh, red, uh, red vehicles. And sort of on the periphery of, these, of this range, we do have a lot of development, as many of you know, and as many of you contribute to, um, we have 
uh, a lot of techniques from control theory, PID control, feedback linearization, um, and nonlinear control as well that help us to analyze systems on this, uh, on this end where we have few or no autonomous vehicles. Um, I would argue that what we're able to analyze here are systems with low uncertainty in reward or objective function. So these are settings where we actually reduce the uncertainty by design. We may design a reward function, design an objective function that to track a trajectory, for instance. Um, and this is like, arguably a less complicated um, reward function than say, let's, in, let's um, optimize for minimizing air pollution or equity or you know, some, some other function that's uh, sort of has broader scope. On the other end, we have a lot of techniques from stochastic systems uh, such as polling systems um, and others such as reservation systems that allow us to analyze systems uh, that are fully autonomous. And what I would argue um, here is that we have systems that have low uncertainty in the transitions or the dynamics of the system. So uh, informally, uh, if we control everything, we can you know, fully determine the next state. And so there's very little uncertainty in the transitions. So um, the work that I had been doing for the last several years has focused on, well, what about this intermediate regime where we have maybe high uncertainty in both the rewards because we, we are interested in um, reward functions with, or objectives with a broader scope and we don't control everything. And so there's uh, more uncertainty in the transitions. And so this is where uh, we ask the question sort of as a hypothesis, does reinforcement learning actually uh, fill this niche uh, and, and, and is able to contribute to analyzing systems in this intermediate regime? And, um, this, uh, as you've seen in Alex's talk and in several of the other works, uh, the answer is something like yes. So this talk is not about this. This talk is actually focused on the second axis of difficulty, which I will call uh, very vaguely just scope. So this, is, this has to do with, say, the number of vehicles in the network, the size of the road network, the number of types of vehicles, there's a lot of heterogeneity and variety in the, um, in the traffic scenario that uh, one, one could possibly imagine. And there's a huge range in scope or scale from this like ring road setting and uh, you know, some city. And again, at the periphery, we have a variety of techniques drawing from uh, dynamical systems, control, stochastic systems that allow us to make some progress in in analyzing these systems, but there's a ton to go. And as we go up this, uh, this axis, we do suffer from this curse of dimensionality. So my question is, to what extent can RL, uh, reinforcement learning, continue to contribute in this problem space? So, so that we're on the same page, let's talk a bit about uh, what reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning in particular means in this context. So um, deep reinforcement learning is uh, a, a field that stems from machine learning and optimal control. And it uh, studies the interaction between an agent, in this case, our autonomous vehicle or vehicles and the environment. Uh, so the rest of the vehicles that are not automated, the roads themselves, the traffic lights, you know, everything else. And what we're concerned with here is um, we want to make good decisions for our agent. Uh, so in this talk, we'll also focus on vehicle accelerations more generally in the transportation system. There can be a variety of different kinds of actions that are considered. Uh, the goal of reinforcement learning is to now find, uh, optimize for some, some policy function often denoted by pi, which maps from the state of the environment to some action in order to maximize some reward. And we're often consider, we're often very interested in uh, more complex, larger scope rewards, such as global rewards, for instance, the average velocity of the whole system, potentially traded off with energy and um, travel time and so on. So the optimization, function, uh, optimization problem looks like this, where we optimize for uh, over theta, which may be the weights of a deep neural network, uh, hence deep reinforcement learning. And we optimize over the sum of rewards over some time period, uh, also called the cumulative rewards or the returns. 
And so my deep curiosity over the last um, number of years and continuing now is we've seen some really exciting successes of deep reinforcement learning in a variety of domains, for instance, video games, uh, physics, locomotion, board games. And I'm just sort of itching to understand to what extent these techniques can extend to give us some insight into societal systems. So one of the commonalities between these three domains is that there is, uh, in some sense, unlim unlimited data. And uh, reinforcement learning, the state of the field right now is that these algorithms are pretty inefficient, as we saw in some of the other talks as well. Um, and so what's really nice about transportation and traffic in particular is that we do have this wonderful ecosystem of traffic simulators that we can benefit from. And we have to be very careful because these are no longer perfect simulators such as we might have for a board game. So we have to be very careful in how we use these. However, we do have um, these simulators in a way that I think many real world domains do not. And so this is like one really exciting um, advantage that I think the, uh, the traffic community has. So I won't belabor um, this, uh, Alex already showed this. Uh, we are essentially able to uh, model uh, different traffic phenomena within this deep reinforcement learning framework and have a fraction of vehicles act as learning agents, uh, for instance, five to 15% and optimize for some system level objectives such as velocity. And we're able to demonstrate the improvement uh, purely using um, this learning-based approach with minimal analysis, with minimal understanding of our own on the dynamics of the system. I'm gonna show one example, and this will allow me to transition into this, this transfer learning uh, portion of this talk. Um, this scenario may also look familiar to some of you. This is an adaptation of some work that uh, um, Eugene Kanad um, uh, Abudi had done uh, several years ago. Uh, we're taking a different lens at this, but I'm going to first set up the, um, the, the, the stage with um, uh, related um, scenario setup. So we're considering this uh, bottleneck network. Uh, where um, many of you may be familiar with this phenomenon called capacity drop. So the idea is that as one uh, pushes inflow into a uh, bottleneck network, uh, so in this case, this is a bottleneck that starts with four lanes, constricts into two, constricts into one. Um, there's this interesting phenomenon where as we increase the inflow, the, the x-axis is inflow, the y-axis is outflow, we would expect um, the, there to be a line, but then we can see that there is like actually physical space, physical capacity uh, limitations on this, uh, in this bottleneck. So we would expect it to sort of level off at some point. However, um, what actually happens in practice is that there's a drop in capacity before a leveling off. So this is really interesting. And so uh, we and um, the prior work are interested in whether a fraction of vehicles, if they were controlled, could alleviate this capacity drop. Okay, so uh, with 10% of vehicles, um, uh, we demonstrate that, yes, we can uh, effectively alleviate this capacity drop. Okay, so this is the experimental setup. From here, what we do is we're also interested in, we also just sort of experimentally took this policy that we train, again, using reinforcement learning. We have a policy now that uh, act that apply is applied to 10% of vehicles. And we also just sort of semi-arbitrarily apply it to um, uh, different fractions of vehicles. So this plot here now shows um, this same policy. Uh, we just apply it to a setting where we have anywhere from one to 20% of vehicles that are, um, that are, are used. It's the same policy. So this is, uh, so we're just sort of, you know, trying it out. And what we see interestingly is, so recall this is the capacity drop phenomenon originally. This line right here actually corresponds to 1% of vehicles um, uh, being learned, uh, uh, being learning agents. Uh, this corresponds to 2%. This corresponds to 3%. We see actually a graceful degradation of the learned policy to 
the true phenomenon, uh, the original phenomenon. And this is interesting because, uh, I mean, we sort of have no idea what would happen. Like this is an arbitrarily learned policy. We don't understand deep neural networks, but the idea that um, applying this uh, in, in a way that in, in which we relax the conditions to be closer to the baseline scenario and in, and like through analysis, the results also gracefully decay to the original scenario. We found this interesting because this is, this is demonstrating that there is something captured by these policies that um, applies, that transfers in some sense to the, these alternate scenarios. So we've been playing around with these ideas of transfer learning. We saw some in Alex's talk as well. Uh, here, we, we then took that same policy and we, saw, we asked the question like, would it apply across different kinds of bottlenecks? So this is a bottleneck uh, of eight lanes constricting to four, constricting to two. There's here, down here is a longer bottleneck with four segments rather than three. And again, we are able to avoid this capacity drop phenomenon through this kind of transfer without actually without the learning agent having ever seen these scenarios, these bottlenecks, or a world in which there are only 1% autonomous vehicles or 20% autonomous vehicles. We have only seen a world with this particular bottleneck and 10% of autonomous vehicles. So this, is, this got us um, really excited because this, um, this is, what this indicates to us is that for the, for the for how much variety we have in the in traffic networks and traffic scenarios, we might not need to like train from scratch like each time. So colloquially, I'll just say you know no two cities are the same, and even more no two like neighborhoods of a city are the same. Um, the we actually have a combinatorial number of environments, and the factors are very numerous. There is the road network itself. There is roadway signage, there's rules of the roads, there's you know, how much demand there is at some particular time on, on those roads. There's the types of vehicles, speed limits, and, and so on and so forth. There's a combinatorial set of environments and it would be intractable in, this, in another sense in, if we had to, um, in order to understand the impact of autonomous vehicles, if we had to you know, redo a, a, uh, a reinforcement learning experiment for each one. So this is what we're calling the curse of variety, which parallels this curse of dimensionality. is not is a different problem. And the question again is, can we get away with not solving, you know, the combinatorial number of environments in this problem domain? So the research question um, is, yes, can knowledge be transferred across traffic scenarios? And what we want to analyze now is, now that we've seen some hints of transfer learning being successful, uh, you know, can we study this a bit more rigorously? So let me talk about what transfer learning is. Um, so it is the use of knowledge uh, gained from one source task. So for instance, like we might have a source task here, uh, for instance, for instance, the circular track. And can we use the knowledge gained to bias the learning process towards um, uh, a target uh, on a target task towards a good set of hypotheses? So for instance, here we might have, um, here we might have our target task, maybe this grid network. And so we might um, distill some knowledge from it through training, and then we might transfer this knowledge onto this, um, this alternate task through either directly reusing the policy, using the value function. There are a variety of ways of transferring. In this particular talk, we're gonna mostly focus on uh, transferring the policy. And then one can further uh, extract knowledge from this new environment, there's a more extreme setting, which is called zero shot transfer, which is the case in which there is no further uh, learning uh, or knowledge extraction from the target task. And this is akin to out of distribution generalization in machine learning. Okay. So again, the question is, can transfer learning help to overcome this curse of variety? Um, and now what we wanna do is we wanna, now that we have this hint that transfer learning is um, is effective, can we be more systematic in studying when and when it does not work? And so uh, we, uh, we approach this from, uh, from a point of curiosity for mixed autonomy traffic. However, the insights may extend to other networked uh, dynamical systems or multi-agent systems. 
in order to do this study, we want a sufficiently diverse set of environments that are different, but not too different from one another. And we also will uh, require that observation and action spaces are compatible across these environments in order to facilitate this, this kind of transfer. And as a bonus, we may gain some insight into mixed autonomy. Um, uh, and the class of environments that we happen to choose for this study is, is intersections. Okay. So this is the set of environments that we choose for this study. So again, we want some, some variety. So these are a few different grid, uh, grid networks, grid sizes, uh, two, by, uh, two by one up through uh, three by three. Um, we study both uh, two-way intersections as well as four-way intersections. We study um, uh, 16, I believe, different inflow configurations for, these are specified for the two directions. Uh, we study a variety of percentages of, of autonomous vehicles. Our problem setup is, as follows. Uh, so one of the unique things that we do is uh, what we're calling this chain-based observation design. So a uh, fraction of vehicles are autonomous. What is the observation space? We observe um, what we call chains. Chains are uh, uh, basically platoons of vehicles led by an autonomous vehicle and ending just before the next autonomous vehicle. So we observe the position and velocity for the, um, the autonomous vehicle and the, last ve the first and last vehicles in the chain. We observe the chain, uh, the first chain for each uh, approaching lane. And we also observe, so in some cases we'll have a, what we call a half chain, which is where we have a sequence of, um, of human driven vehicles that are not led by an autonomous vehicle. So we'll also observe the first half chain. Okay, so this is an observation design that is compatible across these, um, uh, the variety of networks that we're considering here. Uh, we're, uh, other than that, we try to simplify the study as much as possible. So we're considering a very simple um, action space of uh, full acceleration, full deceleration, or do nothing. Um, the reward function is pretty simple. It is just the outflow of the system uh, penalized by the number of co uh, collisions. And uh, there's some additional details here on the training if, in case you're, you're interested. Uh, but we try to do minimal reward shaping uh, this is a cooperative um, shared parameter multi-agent uh, setup, and we use multi uh, we use policy gradient methods, and uh, we do uh, multitask uh, uh, learning over the the sixteen different inflow configurations. Uh, we do compare with a number of baselines, which I won't go into too much detail here, uh, but uh, the details are are in the paper. Uh, I'll just emphasize here that. Uh, are we, we compare against uh, traffic signal baselines. In our scenarios with mixed autonomy, we, the, our scenarios do not have traffic signals, uh, but the standard uh, point of comparison would be traffic signals for intersections. So we have a couple there where we, have, um, we compare with equal phase as well as max pressure. Um, we also consider an even stronger baseline, which we call an oracle, which is separately uh, phase optimized for each different in each different ones, each different uh, inflow configuration among the 16, whereas the baselines here are uh, optimized over uh, all 16 configurations jointly. Okay, so now I'll get to the transfer um, portion. I guess before that, I need, to, I need to first be able to successfully train on my source task and then do some transfer onto a target task. So now I'm going to consider. I want to transfer on. Or I want to. I want to um, first train on uh, some simpler setting and potentially uh, transfer to some other. I guess in this case, more complicated setting. So here I have a two by one uh, network that is a two way network, and um, I won't spend too much time on this. What we basically find is that uh, thirty three percent of vehicles is sufficient to surpass uh, all of our all of the traffic signal baselines uh, and that's an insight on the mixed autonomy uh, side uh, we actually see a little bit of degradation in performance for higher fractions of autonomous vehicles which shouldn't be the case so this we believe is an optimization issue rather than a scientific uh, finding um, and I, I sorry I should have said these these uh, numbers here are percentages relative to the oracle which is displayed on the left so close to 100% is good. And so we have this scenario of 33% where the numbers are very high 
and higher than these uh, baseline uh, baseline scenario uh, baseline um, uh, baseline methods. And on the top row are the different fractions of autonomous vehicles. So what we find um, just in quick video form is again there are no traffic signals in this scenario, but the vehicles essentially learn to implement a traffic light in this scenario. And we can see th from the time space diagram as well that. Uh, groups of vehicles, the darker lines are the autonomous vehicles, the uh, lighter lines are the human driven vehicles that they um, learn to coordinate and share that intersection space uh, and, and avoid queuing. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this policy and we're going to uh, do zero shot transfer to another scenario. Um, okay, I'll skip this. Okay, actually, just so that you see queuing, this is what happens if we don't train. <laughs> then like the vehicles sort of trade off at the intersection. All right, so now what we're interested in is like, does this policy that we learn like, is it useful elsewhere or do we have to train from scratch for a larger network? And part of the motivation here is that it's actually rather difficult to train from scratch in this larger network. Uh, so, you know, can we, you know, can we take a shortcut? And so what we do is we take the 33% and 50% autonomous vehicle policies and we, do zero shot transfer. We do not, again, we have ne never seen this scenario in, in training before. We can see from these um, sort of fingerprint plots, these heat maps, that the performance is still, let's say for the 33%, still exceeds the baselines, despite never having seen this scenario before. Okay, and so here's a video of that result. And so you can see similar um, queuing, uh, sorry, like uh, platooning behaviors in this scenario, despite the training being on a two by one uh, scenario. So um, that's mostly what I wanted to, that's most of the main message I wanted to convey. We do the same thing for four way intersections. And so what we do here, this is like even potentially a little bit more interesting. We actually train on one intersection and transfer to two intersections. This is a four uh, four way intersection. Again, when we train um, with, in this case, fifty percent autonomous vehicles, it exceeds the the baseline methods, and uh, and we can see this is um, just the result of the vehicles are learning are learning to coordinate across the two lanes in the same direction or in the same like horizontal or vertical directions, uh, and when we do this zero shot transfer to um, the uh, two uh, four-way intersections, we see, you know, some sort of emergent coordination that occurs. And the performance is actually comparable to baselines, again, despite never having seen a second intersection. So in conclusion, uh, this chain-based observation design enables us to uh, more so systematically study transfer learning for mixed autonomy traffic. Uh, we find that uh, trained policies generalize in a variety of traffic networks without fine-tuning. This is a zero-shot case. Uh, and even in many cases, such as in the intersection uh, setting, exceeds strong baselines. We find that 33 to 50% autonomous vehicles can achieve near-optimal performance in intersection networks. And so that is at the, so scientifically, that is the point at which the performance is comparable to, um, to signalized uh, control. There's a ton of future work that we're very excited about here, including considering richer objectives, potentially, you know, what is, is there more benefits to be had if we consider joint control of traffic signals and autonomous vehicles? And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I actually have a fundamental question about the, the term transfer learning. So um, does transfer learning now in this context uh, more mean that you learn and then you transfer it over? Um, or does it mean you change something about how you learn because you know you want to transfer it? Yeah, in this context, uh, we are transferring the policy. So we are first training and then uh, transferring the policy to a new setting. I understand. But um, one thing one could do is just, I'm learning the same way. I'm not changing anything about the learning. And I just want to see how well it transfers to other things, right? 
But then it sounds a little misnomer to me to call it transfer learning because the term transfer learning sounds like you're changing something about how you're learning. But that's not the case, right? Or, or I mean, or it seems like it partially is, right? So it seems like I'm trying to find sort of what's the fundamental uh, academic question, right? Is it like one wants to understand what types of design of observation space and action space or, or something are uh, particularly amenable towards working in transfer learning and which ones are not, or sort of what, what does one change at all about the design of the learning process so that it transfers efficiently or not? Sort of what, what is the, change, the, the fundamental intellectual sort of change or question or scientific question there? Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Um, I would say the, the fundamental question is when can we, when can we avoid training in all scenarios? Mm -hmm. And a hypothesis is that transfer of knowledge from some scenarios to others would allow us to avoid that. I agree. I agree. Uh, I'm just trying to sort of try to get a grasp. I and mean, first of all, this is hard. This is very complicated, right? And and people, nobody in the world understands it uh, exactly. But I'm trying to see how this goes from just trial and error to sort of what's the structural uh, uh, sort of fundamental sort of uh, approach to to conceptualize it. Yeah, yeah. So I would say that that's exactly the goal of this direct this line of research. Mm -hmm. So we have seen a number of successful instances of transfer, including in uh, highway settings, in the ring road, in the bottleneck, as I showed earlier. And those are all completely trial by error. Those are completely like, you know, our intuit, like, I don't know, we don't even have any reason to believe it should work, but let's just try it. Mm -hmm. Here is where we are uh, taking a more like factorial approach where we are saying, okay, here's a set of, here's like now a class of environments and now let's scientifically study when it should and should not transfer. Mm -hmm. And so that is the question here. Like when should it transfer and when should it not transfer? And we So have, in this example, when does it not transfer, for example? So for instance, it does not transfer um, when we look at even larger networks. So that is still an open question. So for instance, I showed the, the networks um, transferring between uh, this two by one and this three by three. It does not transfer to a five by five. Why would it not transfer to a five by five? But, the, but it does transfer to a three by three. I see, okay. And those are the patterns that one hopes to understand. Yes. Okay, got it. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. Hey, I have a question. Yeah, and thank you for the question because I meant to mention that, but if, missed doing so. I, I mean, uh, as I said, right, nobody understands this. I just really wanted to understand sort of there's a bigger pattern and, and, and it's so many details, right? So so I really want to understand this because I was also wondering, sorry, but I was also wondering, for example, if one changes the way people uh, go through the intersection, right? Like the humans are suddenly are more hesitant or something. That might also be something where it could not yeah. transfer at all and suddenly break down, right? So those are, but those are the key questions, right? Yes, and another factor that we have considered, and I, out of due to time, I didn't include it here, is uh, right now the vehicles are even are regularly spaced. So it's like one AV, two human drivers, one AV, two human drivers, and we also have been experimenting with what if that's more random? What if yeah, the okay. what if it's an irregular pattern of autonomous vehicles? How will yeah, that sorry, transfer? Sorry, sorry, sorry for the time. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Sarah. Oh yeah. Um, so I just had a quick question where you said that um, when you guys trained on different percentages of autonomous vehicles for the bottleneck scenario, um, I think you were saying that it kind of allowed us to guess whether the transferring would work. Um, but did you train on different, did you train like different policies on each of the different percentages? And in that case, I'm not quite sure how that would show anything about whether transfer would work. Um, let's see. So we, uh, let me, I, I'm not sure if I quite caught your question. Oh, um, let me try. So we, um, so we are showing like a, a subset of our, our results here. Uh, so we studied, we, we, we trained a policy for this 
scenario and we transferred it to a number of other scenarios. So we, for instance, transferred it to a two by two uh, grid network. I, due to time, I didn't include that. Uh, we also transferred it to this three by three. We also transferred it to the four by four and five by five. So we are taking, we're, so we're interested in, you know, do we have to separately train on the two by two, three by three, four by four, five yeah. by five? So Sorry, I was asking question? about the earlier part of the talk when you mentioned in the bottleneck example. Oh. Um, so uh, in that case, did you trans did you do transfer in that situation or? Yes. So in this case, we train in this scenario, and we transferred to these two scenarios, and we transferred to these, like these scenarios. Okay, got it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, hi, Kathy. Uh, great presentation. I, I just have a quick question. Um, you this kind of uh, hints at something that uh, Professor Zeibold said at the end, which is, I I see that I I understand what you're trying to do, but I'm curious as to how that's dependent on how you model the in in some sense you're modeling human decision making when you talk about merging when you talk about you know going to an intersection maybe. How dependent does this seem to be on how you define that choice to merge or let a car through, for example, in the bottleneck example? Is that is that something? Can you comment on like how how that's a challenge or if that's not so big of a hurdle? So I would say like we only consider one uh, one model which is, so we do a lot of our tests in, in the Sumo simulator. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're considering the, for the most, to the most, yeah, I think, yes, to the most, to the furthest extent, uh, default behavior modeled in Sumo. And all I can say, because we only consider like one type of be, like human driving behavior, mm -hmm. I can only say that like, we didn't have issues with this one. If it were difficult, like presumably we would have run into issues uh, I see, I see. given this one type of modeling. If we were to say take another simulator and tr uh, you know try to apply this on that kind of human behavior modeling, um, I don't expect much issue. Like I I would maybe expect that we would maybe have to retrain on that scenario uh, on that kind of human modeling but i could be surprised i'm i'm continuously surprised at how effective transfer learning is yeah sure yeah okay thanks That's, thanks for yeah. that answer and again we we were really looking at zero shot transfer in this case and so like we we didn't fine tune at all in the target task we could have and presumably the performance can only increase from there so i could imagine transferring with uh incorrect be or like a different behavior model of human driving and fine tuning uh, with with the appropriate one. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the great questions. Okay, I guess there's a break now. I'm going to pause the recording.